you get some people coming in. Usually they start flooding in at the start of the hour. Um, but uh, for now, my name is uh, Joyce Ganunez Medina. I am in community engagement at the Tennessee State Museum. And today um, we have a special guest, but uh, I'll talk about him in a second. <laughs> All right, so once again, I am Jessica Nunez Medina, and today we have Dr. Daryl Carter, and he is a professor of history at the East Tennessee State University, uh, and he specializes in 20th and 21st century um, American politics uh, with a specification or a specialization on the role of the intersections of race, class, and gender, and how they play into uh, political history. Uh, so today he's going to actually talk to us about um, the role of women and minorities after the 19th Amendment was passed. And so that's going to be really interesting. Uh, if you want to get started, uh, you can unmute yourself and take it away. Thank you, Joyce. Um, welcome, everybody, and thank you for having me. Um, I am uh, a professor of history at East Tennessee State University. Uh, my first book was on President Clinton and it's entitled uh, Brother Bill, uh, the Paul, President Clinton and the Politics of Race and Class. And so I spent a lot of my time looking at American politics and a lot of my time looking at how uh, social issues, how class issues, how uh, gender issues and race issues uh, impact that. And so as we get started uh, today, I first uh, want to say welcome, but also want to say happen, happy Women's Equality Day. And I'm going to give uh, a more general uh, overview and look at some of these issues regarding women and the right to vote, uh, both in Tennessee as well as in the country at large. And so as we get started here, I think it's important for us to think about uh, the fact that we're 100 years past ratification of the 19th Amendment, and we are more than 50 years past the uh, passage of the Voting Rights uh, Act. And yet today we are still dealing with issues of access to the ballot, issues regarding who can vote and who can't, issues regarding uh, states that are arguably depend on your point of view, making it harder for people to vote. Issues in some people's mind regarding the, uh, you know, the protection of the ballot box, right? And the protection of the vote. And so these issues are not just past, but they're present. And how we deal with them going forward is going to be very important. So we can look to, toward the past to kind of get an idea and understanding about uh, our own time. Uh, as well as understanding other people's time. So if we were to go back to the nation's founding, understand that most people are going to be excluded from political power. This includes most whites, it's going to include all slaves, free blacks, it's gonna include uh, white women, Native Americans, all of them are gonna be excluded from the political process, from political power, from the right to, to you know, hold public office, things of that nature. And so I, I point this out at the very beginning because often, and I see this with my own students, there's a common uh, myth uh, that goes around that the country was always like it is now, and it just simply wasn't. It was a long uh, struggle over 200 plus years to uh, get the type of expansive freedom that we currently enjoy. When it comes to women, and women in American politics, there are several things that impacted negatively upon women. One is the belief widely held in the 17, uh, 1700s and the 1800s 
that women were inferior to men in all respects. This includes intellectually uh, being inferior to men. This is also a religious thing in the sense that there's religious opposition to it. If you go to the New Testament, you can see where Paul talks about uh, he does not allow women to speak, right? Uh, and that women should not speak. That type of uh, uh, scriptural interpretation is going to be used as well to prevent women from in, in entering public life in a meaningful way. And that women lack uh, uh, temperament. They lack the intellectual temperament to uh, engage in public life. That women were simply inferior, uh, they were emotional, that they were incapable of rendering decisions on matters of great public importance. Finally, on this issue, that women simply belonged in the home, that whether it's a religious standpoint or a social or parent, uh, parental, parental, excuse me, uh, issue, that women belonged in the home and that that was their rightful place. And so these beliefs about women that we find archaic, that we find offensive today, um, undergirded much of that opposition to uh, women in politics and women gaining the right to vote. But I also like to point out here that while these things were extremely important, okay, there was something else that impacted uh, people's beliefs regarding women and politics. And those issues had to deal with power, raw political power. Who has it and who doesn't? If, we, if you can narrow down the number of people who have access to political power, including the right to vote, then you can maintain a status quo, you can maintain your own political power, so on and so forth. So these practical concerns of having to deal with women in the political space are, are very important to understand. Um, politicians, generally speaking, if they're popular, they, they want a lot of people to vote, but if they're not popular, they want fewer people to vote. On top of that, when you, you're talking about spending precious resources like time and money to campaign for people to vote, if you can, uh, uh, you know, lop off a, a certain part of the electorate, then it makes it a lot more efficient and, and cost effective for you in terms of, of campaigning. So if you were to look today, you'll notice that both of the two major political parties spend a lot of time maintaining voter records. Uh, they know who voted, when they voted, when, when's the last time they were at the ballot box, what elections they voted in, things of that nature. And so they can decide, for example, in Nashville, Tennessee, or Memphis, or Johnson City, or Mountain City, they can, they can see, okay, this part of the city has a high voter turnout, this part of the city does not, so on and so forth. So I point that out to say that, yes, there are issues regarding religion, there's re issues regarding, uh, uh, you know, supposed inferiority of women, things of that nature, but it's also simply an issue of power, maintaining power, and, and practical concerns as well about uh, uh, restricting ballot uh, access. And so you can see those types of concerns uh, going all the way back to Seneca Falls in 1848, uh, in which resolutions are, are adopted, including uh, arguably the most controversial regarding voting. And it's something that pops up through abolitionism, through throughout the Civil War, uh, and of course, all the way through the end of the century and into the progressive era. So I do want everyone to kind of bear that in mind. When it comes to women in American politics, there's a misnomer that women have not been there until the 20th century, right? So that women only became involved when they got the right to vote, or women only became involved when they received uh, uh, protection under the Voting Rights Act. But the simple fact of the matter is, is women have always been involved in politics. Now, the question is, how did they uh, exert power and influence? How did they impact their, their contemporary situations? And so one of the ways that we see this uh, in the mid 19th century is the issue of abolitionism, where white women uh, joined the cause for the, the freedom of slaves and helped to lead to the great civil war, that believing that slavery in itself was a sin, but there's also the belief as well that participating in the freedom of slaves uh, would eventually lead to, to women having full uh, freedom and political rights as well. 
Uh, but how that is done, we see that difference there to have how people are approaching this within women's rights movements. You're going to see a splitting of, of some of these groups after the Civil War, and particularly after the 15th Amendment passes and is ratified uh, by 1870 about which direction the movement should go in, when should they push for the right to vote, things of that nature. And for some bitter, bitter uh, 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 regret over the fact that women weren't included in the, in the 15th Amendment. Um, moving forward just a, a little bit here, I also wanna talk about the fact that by here in the state of Tennessee, by the early uh, 1900s, by 1905, 1906, 1907, uh, there's a revived movement to push forward for the issue of, of women's suffrage. We see organizations such as the Tennessee uh, uh, Equal Suffrage Association, the National uh, American Women's Association. We see others individually uh, and in a community sense uh, promoting the issue of women's uh, suffrage. And this is very difficult because the South is arguably the most resistant uh, to the issue of suffrage for cultural and political uh, reasons. Uh, the South tends to be behind on some of these issues at this point in time uh, in the early 20th century. And so women are fighting an uphill battle in certain areas of the South uh, in a way that they're not going to fight in certain areas of the West uh, or other areas in which uh, there's going to be, I think, a greater acceptance of women gaining the right to vote uh, in these other areas than they will in the South. Um, to help us think about where these women are going at this point in time, I also want you to think about the fact that these women are fully a part of the club era and they're fully a part of uh, progressivism in which they're creating organizations and, and clubs and and, and, and other groups that are going to pursue uh, uh, a number of meaningful issues, which is very, very important. Often using motherhood, using womanhood, uh, the home, uh, marriage, uh, religion, et cetera, to justify their activities in the public space. And so as we're thinking about that, think about issues of uh, uh, the home, think about issues of protecting uh, children, issues of uh, uh, protecting the wallet, um, re political reform, uh, the right to vote, and a host of other issues. We can see this with the Women's Christian Temperance Organizations. Um, these organizations are going to be very important because there's a creation, a sense of uh, togetherness that's, that comes with those organizations. Those organizations can wield political power uh, by helping to deliver votes, by also con uh, convincing other people uh, to join their cause. Make no mistake about it, the middle class nature of uh, the white women's movement at this time uh, underscores the class aspects of the, the women's suffrage movement and progressivism in the early 20th century. Um, these women are in part promising to help beautify and clean up uh, American politics uh, to make American society better uh, by having a woman's uh, 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 voice heard. Now, what are they dealing with at this time? They're outside of just the women's issues. They're dealing with a rapidly changing political and economic environment in which industrialization is changing the very way in which people live and work. And so we can see across the nation, particularly in the major urban metropolitan areas where people are leaving the rural communities, the farms, uh, to, for the factories, for the mills, the plants, et cetera, uh, in the cities. And so there's great questions about where do we go from here? What does this look like? And uh, should women have a say in this? And by the way, we have a lot of poor women, a lot of poor immigrant women, a lot of poor African-American women who are also going into work in a way that they may not have quite so much a generation before. So there's great questions about what America is going to look like here at the dawn of the 20th century. For African-American women, it's a little bit different. And so uh, I wanna move into this area now as we think about uh, uh, black women because they're often excluded from discussions of uh, suffrage from the 19th Amendment and from women's rights uh, uh, discussions as a whole. And so when we think about African-American women, there are some differences here. 
One, African-American women tend to be in a position economically, materially, uh, educationally inferior to that of whites at that time due to massive and, and stringent uh, Jim Crow segregation through court rulings, through the uh, violent white opposition of the South, uh, so on and so forth. And so black women are trying desperately uh, uh, to handle a number of issues in addition to what uh, white uh, uh, women are doing at that time. And so they're struggling with that. They are also struggling with the fact that many white suffragists uh, are fully um, committed to the idea of separate but equal and to the idea of Jim Crow, in part because of racial concerns, but also in racism, but also because they believe that if black women are fully uh, brought in to the movement, if black women are given prominent roles, if this becomes a biracial type of situation, then it would come at the cost of white women gaining the right to vote. Um, even the League of Women's Voters tends to operate in segregated uh, units. So what you see here in terms of the black women who are becoming active uh, at this time, they too are a part of the club era. They're, they are a part of these women who are joining these organizations, creating these organizations, and they tend, much like their white uh, counterparts, to be middle and upper class. So what do I mean by that? For African-American communities, a little bit different. Uh, for some of these issues. So let me discuss this briefly uh, as we talk about the turn of the century. These African-American women tend to have greater access to education and educational resources than the average uh, African-American at that time. Two, they tend to be rather new in terms of their class status. They haven't been there for long. Uh, three, there's an issue with colorism there in the sense that uh, African American men and women who are who have a lighter complexion tend to be thought of as better than uh, more dark uh, complected people, and so that colorism issue is something that you can see all the way into the 21st century in the African American community, which is this issue of light skin versus dark skinned blacks, and so um, uh, this is at the same time that. The great HBCUs uh, have just recently been founded. On top of that, uh, they're creating the, the Greek fraternities and sororities that are gonna undergird those, those institutions. And the black community is creating its own world in a sense of creating schools, businesses, uh, things like funeral homes, insurance companies, banks, grocery stores, uh, things of that nature uh, because of the desperate need for economic development, but also the fact that because of Jim Crow, that color line often cannot be crossed, at least not by African-Americans. And so uh, at this point in time, you see uh, that the class issue is, is going to be particularly important for uh, African-Americans, and we're still dealing with that issue uh, today. So these middle-class Black women are are. Uh, concerned with a number of things. I'll mention just a few. One, they, they're concerned about morality. They're concerned about the behavior of men. They're uh, uh, excuse me, concerned with sexual morality. They're concerned with the raising of children. They're concerned with stopping lynchings. Um, and by 1900, you have Jim Crow that's fully in effect. And so Black women are being forced into a public space in a way that they wouldn't have been 15, 20 years ago, in part because black men are being pushed into what one historian called the nadir of Amer African American life, which is Jim Crow has just totally decimated black political activity in most of the South. Um, and, and the Redeemers and others in the South have kicked out all the black politicians by the beginning of the 20th century. So black women are dealing with a number of those types of, uh, of, of issues. Um, and when they're fighting, for example, and Ida B. Wells is talking about this in Memphis, she's talking about this in, in Illinois, uh, about the, the scourge of lynching. You know, they're doing it from a very personal standpoint of fathers, husbands, sons, cousins, uncles, and others who could be lynched, you know, without 
you know, any type of recourse. And so I do want you to, to think about that uh, as well. Now, they are concerned with the issue of the vote. There's no doubt about it. And black women are going to be, and black women suffragists are going to be uh, active participants and pushing for women to get the right to vote. But they want to be included in that. Okay. They want to be included in that. And so as the lead up for Tennessee uh, in terms of the the, the ratification uh, in, in 1920 uh, is in, you know, you see this deep issue of, you know, religious, you know, opposition to it. You see people who just don't want women to have the right to vote, but you also see something that's a recurring theme in the American South, which is the use of race as a bludgeon against any type of uh, expansive movement for freedom, all right? And so what I mean by that is that if you allow women to vote, you will eventually have, of course, black women voting, and we can't have that. So, you know, we pro it's probably not such a bright idea to have women voting, things of that nature. Um, so white Southerners are warning about the increase of black voters, and they're using in some, in some conversations the language used uh, uh, in the pa recent past regarding reconstruction, about the horrors of reconstruction and black rule and things of that, of that nature. Um, <clears throat> some white women are complicating this by demanding uh, or at least suggesting that there should be educational requirements and literacy tests and things of that nature for black uh, uh, women uh, to be able to vote. And so you see something that is, in terms of black women and African-Americans as a whole, something that is so much a part of the progressive era, which is we want reform, we want reform, we want reform, we want, we want progress, unless it's for African-Americans, okay? So that's a recurring theme there that I, I do wanna point out. The, uh, the next part of that is, is the same time that white women are advocating for the right to vote in Tennessee, the nation is dealing with the effects of the First World War. The, the, the state of Tennessee and the South are dealing with uh, a, a rise in racial violence, okay? We call this Red Summer. We're not just here in the South, but in all uh, parts of the country, you see dramatic uh, uh, beatings, lynchings, murders, assaults, rapes, and other uh, type of uh, illicit and immoral and un, uh, unjustified activity against African Americans. Um, on top of that, you see terrorist organizations um, like the Ku Klux Klan re enjoying a resurgence, okay? Enjoying a resurgence. And so what I mean by that is places like Tennessee where I donated uh, a photo uh, a few years ago, I believe to the State Museum, in which the Klan is marching in Bristol, Tennessee, right around this time. And so <clears throat> as, you, as you think about this, you can't just look at suffrage and women's suffrage and, and African-American women in this kind of narrow confines, but you have to put it in its broader context in which uh, you're dealing with a country that is increasingly frustrated, tired of progressivism, wanting a quote unquote return to normalcy, wanting to get back to business, tired of the war, things of that nature. And of course, after Tennessee uh, ratifies and, and it becomes a law of the land, then you have the same issue for black women that you have for black men, which is the white South is going to use whatever means that it can, literacy tests, poll taxes, things of that nature, to make sure that women cannot uh, 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 vote any more than black, that black women cannot vote any more than, than, than uh, black men. Um, hundreds of black Tennessee suffragists worked for the passage and ratification of the 19th Amendment. And in many ways, it was the beginning, uh, not the end of the push for black women to gain voting rights. And like so many things in this country, voting rights uh, would be delayed for black women. And it would take the Voting Rights Act in the mid 1960s to uh, allow women the right to, to, to vote and to bring in federal protection of the, of the Department of Justice 
to make sure that that happens uh, and that that would happen. A um, couple other things I wanted to discuss here. The black women who are participating in this are not just suffragists, they're not just so, uh, you know, progressives, but this is a part of black feminism. It is a part of, you know, what we'll call race women, uh, where uh, black women are reluctantly tolerating current situations in order to fight another day, that they are totally uh, engaged in, in not only the movement, but the ethos of things like the, the, the new Negro movement in the country, uh, the NAACP and its activities, the Niagara movement, uh, 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 and, and, and you know, W.E.B. Du Bois and others who are advocating greater and greater uh, freedom. So as we think about, and, and I'm not going to take too much longer, but as we think about some of these, these issues here, between 1920 and 1965, in the state of Tennessee, there will be a lot of activity towards spreading that, that right to vote. We see it in Catholic churches in Nashville and, in, and Memphis. We see the Highlander Folk School uh, and, and the eastern part of the state that's engaging in this, women's groups across the state, the League of Women Voters. Uh, we see the HBCUs in, in Nashville and in Memphis. And in particular, think about Fisk, think about Tennessee State, Meharry, uh, uh, Lemoyne Owens of Memphis, uh, engaging these types of act activities to, to secure uh, uh, privileges for, for Black women. But for, mil for most women, regardless of race, Political opportunity in and of itself is difficult between 1920 and the 1960s. Number one, Tennessee remains a rural state for the most part, okay? A very rural state. And in terms of industrial development, while there is plenty that you can point out from Memphis to Elizabeth and Tennessee, the fact of the matter is it's gonna take World War II to help promote, right? This issue of industrialization in Tennessee. And as that happens, uh, starting in the early 1940s, late 1930s, early 1940s, during the Second World War and, and the issues with Oak Ridge, then you're going to start seeing the cities in Tennessee become increasingly liberal uh, on, on social issues, public policy issues, things of that nature, as Tennessee goes from a simply an agrarian state to a state that is, is diverse in terms of its economic uh, components. Lastly, as, as we, we think about this civil rights from the 1930s all the way into the 1960s in Tennessee, from, from places in Northeast Tennessee where I live to uh, uh, Knoxville and Chattanooga, uh, Memphis, Columbia, uh, Jackson and other areas, uh, the, these places are gonna be very important going, going forward uh, over the period of the next uh, uh, 40 years. And so Tennessee develops, and as it develops, women become increasingly a part of it. But unlike other states, uh, you do not see the same number of women being elected, and I'll talk about that in the future discussion, uh, to public office. In fact, uh, Senator Blackburn is the first woman to be elected to the United States Senate from Tennessee. Uh, it was until the 1970s when you had uh, a Congresswoman Marion uh, Marilyn Lloyd elected the, the Congress from Chattanooga. And so there are, there's some, some challenges there. Okay, I'm going to cut it off here. Um, but I do want to say thank you for, for having me. And I look forward to any discussion uh, we might have. All right, thank you so much for that. Um, we do have a few questions. And I'm going to start off with, uh, do you think that black women had a hard time fighting for suffrage, knowing that segregation would likely keep them from the vote? Yes, I do. I do think it was a hard, it was a hard pill to swallow. Um, we often hear today, for example, of people who are complaining about one issue or another, uh, but imagine you know, no, going into it, knowing that the system would uh, do everything it could to prevent you from exercising those new rights, right? So you're gonna get the right to vote, but then you're gonna show up 
and you know that you're going to get poll tax because poll taxes are still legal, right? And they're going to be legal for decades to come. And so, you know, how do you deal with that? Well, there's a sense of perseverance. There's a sense of there of hope that there will be a better future. There will be a better day. And you see uh, in Republican Party politics in the 1910s and the 1920s, African Americans, including African American women, uh, playing uh, a prominent role. You think about the church thrill. You think about some of the others who are trying to join uh, in this fight. So that at some point, those freedoms will exist, not just for white Americans, but for for Black women as well. Okay, um, we have a long question here, but I think the the little addition at the beginning is important to add. So um, this person asks or says, you mentioned uh, in your talk about the importance of groups in power wanting to retain that political power uh, for the nation's found uh, from the nation's founding and how this prevented and slowed the expansion of the vote. How I hear I'm hearing my feedback. Um, how did politicians reconcile these actions? with rhetoric supporting democracy and voting both in the 1920s and after. Okay, thank you. Thank you guys for the question. Um, I would say that there's a certain a bit of opportunism on the part of certain politicians, right? That if they do this, then women will support them in public office, right? Um, that women will vote for them, things of that nature. In fact, we see by 1928, which is really the first time that you really see a presidential campaign going after the, the female vote, right? When, when President Hoover does that, um, or then Secretary Hoover does that. So yes, there's, there's a, always a desire on the part of politicians to support uh, particularly voting rights for those groups that are going to support them, right? Um, there is also a desire um, to limit other groups that are not going to be so supportive, right? And so you don't have to necessarily, you know, ban them from voting. You could just make it so difficult that they can't vote, right? Or so unpleasant that they don't want to vote. So, for example, uh, black women along with black men will be terrorized for in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, for and 60s for trying to register to vote, trying to cast the ballot things of that nature. And so uh, it's, you know, the, the not to ramble on here, but it is tough um, to reconcile that. And so America is this, and Tennessee reflects this, is this competing interests that are always at each other's throats, right? And um, I would finally say on that, um, that we're still dealing with that today. Thank you. Uh, there's another one here saying, do you think if black women, women were allowed to work more with the large suffrage organizations earlier on that suffrage would have been gained prior to 1920? I, I think that's an excellent question. I will answer it this way. I will say it's possible. But one of the things that we see in American political history is that anytime there is an effort for fusion politics, the idea of bringing particularly blacks and whites together, uh, that there, there's this ferocious backlash to that, right? And so um, to think about this, uh, there are groups as early as the 1820s that were, they were promoting these ideas of kind of you know biracial politics, right? Um, and uh, all the way to Barack Obama. When Barack Obama was elected in 2008, he's, he's elected with a pretty large majority and a broad cross-section of people that included whites and blacks, men and women, so on and so forth, all the way down the line. But within a year or so, uh, opposition to Obama had not only rose up, but it had crystallized, it had formalized, it had organized, and central to that opposition had, was the, the race question, right? And so the, the issue was, you know he's black, right? You know, you know he's not from here, right? 
I mean, it was not centered on the, the very reasonable criticism of, of a lot of Obama's policies, but it was central uh, centered on the issue of his racial uh, background. Um, and so we see that throughout the 20th century. So, for example, if we're talking about the New Deal, the way that uh, Roosevelt gets the New Deal through Congress is he, he basically uh, gives up power in terms of how a lot of those federal programs are going to function in order to allow the South to make sure that Blacks do not receive federal benefits or taxpayer money, while at the same time, white Southerners uh, are able to, to benefit um, uh, from those same programs. So uh, fusion politics is very, very difficult. Um, I often hear people say, you know, how is it, that, and I've had students ask me this, how is it that, you know, all these people voted twice for Obama and then you know, they, they became the most reactionary type person by 2016. And I would say the same, we've seen this before. There's nothing new in that regard. Uh, it's easy to split up people along racial, gender, ethnic, religious lines, right? And so if you can convince people to focus on their, on their religious or their ethnic or their racial identity, then they will forget about other aspects of, of, of their, their life and things that may be meaningful to them, like, economic policy. So fusion politics is very, very hard, and it usually doesn't last that long um, uh, when it does occur. Yeah, that's that's an interesting point. Um, I think we have two more questions. Uh, this is kind of, uh, kind of in your research. Uh, what forms of voter suppression have surprised you the most in, in your research in the past? Say, so can you repeat it, please? What forms of voter suppression surprised you? Maybe I'm a little bit jaded on this issue. Uh, I nothing surprises me in this regard uh, in terms of voter suppression in the past, um, because it's as simple as this: if you are confident in your political platform and the policies that you're espousing, then you shouldn't have any problem. Uh, uh, allowing the greatest number of people to vote. It's just as simple as that. But when you're trying to maintain your own political power at the expense of other people, then you become very, very concerned, right, with who can vote, who can vote. And by the way, at the same time that the Tennessee is ratifying the 19th Amendment, okay, the nation is also in this very uh, uh, beyond red summer, beyond the, the violence of the black veterans are receiving when they get home, you're also seeing these, these immigration groups who are running amok through the country saying, you know, if we let in these Slavs, if we let in these Jews, if we let in these Catholics, if we let in uh, uh, these others, these Asians, then it's going to corrupt American democracy. Um, it's going to harm uh, our, our country. Um, and the, these organizations had existed since the, the early part of the second industrial revolution in which, you know, there was great concern about the immigrant population that was coming into the country. So when we look at the 19th Amendment, we can't look at it simply as an issue of just women, but it's also the context in which they, they are pushing for the, these issues. And this is why you can have, for example, white women on one hand saying we need the right to vote, expansive freedom, but on the other hand, we need to make sure that these people don't have the right to vote, uh, so on and so forth. Right. Um, and then on the other end of that, uh, are there any forms of resistance that have surprised you or amused you? I know um, that when uh, certain groups got together, they would put on, um, pageants in order to raise money for uh, poll, poll taxes for the poor. And I thought that was really neat. Um, is there anything like that that you find interesting? I haven't focused on that part as much. Um, but I think what strikes me um, is the stick to of these groups over a long period of time. And so, for example, if you were to look at the protests that have been happening in the country over the period of the last few months, uh, there's a righteousness to what they're trying to do, which is everybody should be treated uh, as respectfully as possible and according to the Constitution. 
However, what pro, many of the protesters right now don't get is how brutally long those fights were for justice, right? And that takes mental toughness. It takes emotional maturity. It takes training to recognize that we won't be able to get a full loaf now, but if we can get a little piece here, a little piece here, a little piece here, we can build it up over a period of time. You can see this, for example, with the NAACP and its uh, and its campaign of court cases from the 1920s to, through the 1960s, where they almost systematically challenged every aspect of Jim Crow. And so, um, that's hard. That's hard work. That's hard to do. And the fact of the matter for for women, for for African Americans, they're in the minority <laughs> in terms of political power. So you need. If you're these groups, simple politics, you're going to need white buy-in, and you're going to need white male buy-in over over time. And so that is that is hard. But as time goes along, you'll be able to do that. And by the 1980s, you have white women who are openly saying, "We need more women of color." For example, uh, uh, in the movement, et cetera, we were wrong not to have more women of color uh, uh, in in the movement. Okay, um, there's just one more comment and then we'll wrap it up. It says, uh, thank you for explaining the larger context of African American women's perspective on the suffrage movement. Your explanation was one of the best I've ever heard. What type of research or interpretive approach is needed to continue to improve and expand the story? Thank, thank you. Well, number one, I think you know, we've we've spent a lot of time since the 1960s as historians focusing on history from the ground up. And we did this for a couple of reasons. One, because most people's history was excluded because of what a lot of historians still refer to as the great white man history, version of history, which is what we focused on elites. We focus on people in power and things of that nature. But as a political historian, by the, by the 2000s, me and a lot of others were saying, wait a second, people in power matter, right? And yes, you do have a relationship there in which, you know, one is pushing the other, but political power, right, is exercised by people in office, just like political power can be exercised by people in the streets. And so my approach to this would be to incorporate the lives and experiences of everyday people with the decision-making actions, et cetera, of people in real political power. For example, we can see this with Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who uh, brought in his own so-called black cabinet, which included a number of African-American women. And Eleanor Roosevelt herself became not only friendly with but join at the hip in a political sense with a number of African-American women, uh, particularly between the mid thirties and her death in the early 1960s. And so uh, understanding those relationships is important. We've done this in certain ways in regard to political machines and how there was a kind of responsiveness to say a boss tweet at the top to the guy on the street at the precinct level. Um, we need to look at some of that a little bit more in terms of women's rights uh, African American rights, so on and so forth. Uh, we started to do that in certain ways in a very male oriented way in the last you know, generation with civil rights uh, in the 50s and 60s, particularly focused on Malcolm X, Dr. King, and, and other male leaders. Um, but there's a lot more to do uh, in that regard. And uh, finally, I would say on that, that it's important for us. To, to recognize that we only know part of the story. And so we're continuously trying to, to find uh, more. And then I promise this is the last point. We're in, we're, we're in the year 2020 now. There are a lot of these people who are dead, but there's still a lot of these people who are alive that can tell you things that happened in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. I'm a huge proponent, and I've used it in my own research, of oral history, getting these people on tape talking about their life experiences is important. 
for history, historians of slavery, for example, and reconstruction, one of the most valuable uh, archival records they have come from the WPA papers. These were children of slaves, former slaves, who in the 1930s gave all these interviews. And so we had an idea of, okay, this is what resistance looked like. This is how daily life existed, blah, blah, blah. It's how we know, for example, about the massive resistance that slaves put up, not just running away, but things like self-mutilation and breaking of tools and simply, you know, doing something different. So there are, you know, if we can use oral history to kind of document these things, Right. This is what happened in, 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 in Anderson County, Tennessee. This is what happened in, in Montgomery County, Tennessee. This is what happened in Lake County. All right. Those things can help to inform and illuminate how things in the state of Tennessee took place and unfolded over a period of time, as well as nationally. Sorry, I lost my mouse there. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. That was really interesting and insightful information. Um, thank well, you. Yeah. Um, I, really, I really appreciate the time and 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 thank you all for for having me and taking time out of your schedules uh, to to be a part of this uh, event today. Thank you. Yes. Thanks to everyone who joined us, and I want to plug an event. It's not out on our events page yet, but it'll be September 10th in the evening, and it's going to be um, kind of a similar topic. It's called After the 19th, and it's a panel talk, uh, discussing um, different, uh, the suffrage movement after uh, after the 19th um, in these minority groups. And so that'll be really interesting. Make sure to check that out and um, check our Facebook and our website pages for more details on that. Um, but we're going to finish up and uh, you have a good day, good, good rest of your day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.